day and welcome to Provident Financial Services Incorporated fourth quarter conference call. All participants will be in listen only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Please note the events being recorded. I'd all like to turn the conference over to Mr. Len Gleason, Investor Relations Officer. Please go ahead. Thank you, Nick. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for our fourth quarter earnings call. Today's presenters are Chris Martin, Chairman, President, and CEO, and Tom Lyons, Senior Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Before beginning their review of our financial results, we ask that you please take note of our standard caution as to any forward-looking statements that may be made during the course of today's call. Our full disclaimer is contained in this morning's earnings release, which has been posted to the Investor Relations page on our website, Provident.Bank. Now, I'm pleased to introduce Chris Martin, who will offer his perspective on the fourth quarter. Chris? Thank you, Len, and good morning, everybody. Uh, Provident's core earnings of $0.43 cents per share were impacted by continued margin compression, albeit slight, and increased expenses primarily from consulting fees related to CECL modeling and implementation. Our core return on average assets was 1.13%, and core return on average tangible equity was 11.36 for the quarter. We experienced only two basis points of margin compression in Q4 and forecast it being relatively neutral in 2020. The repricing of deposit relationships that had discretionary rates positively impacted overall deposit costs. Competitive deposit pricing has become more rational in our markets, which is a welcome respite for our funding costs. This affords us an opportunity to reduce the rates on our CD book, although not a large portion of our overall deposits. Key to our success will be our ability to continue to grow our non-interest bearing and core deposits. We believe we have reached an inflection point in loan pricing and predict lower single-digit growth in the loan portfolio, which continues to be bombarded by payoffs and refinances uh, away from us. Our loan portfolio is skewed to variable rate product, and we continue to swap out longer-term fixed-rate loans. c lending has become more competitive of late, but we are winning our share of quality loans and relationships. The middle market space has faced headwinds relating to the origination of loans at levels that meet our ROE hurdles. We take all commercial lending expectations to the level of GDP growth, so low single-digit growth is what we expect to see in 2020. Uh, Residential lending has picked up of late, and we continue to be selective in our credit decisioning and leave the aggressive lending to competition who need to have outside growth targets to bolster their margins. Further, we are seeing more and more interest-only periods extended and longer fixed-rate terms than we have in a long while, emanating from the agencies and like companies. On the matter of CECL implementation, we expect incremental volatility since reserve levels will be very dependent on macroeconomic forecasting. This could affect loan pricing in the future also. Our credit costs were elevated this quarter versus the same quarter last year as we continue to conservatively evaluate our classified credits. We have de-emphasized our exposure and concentration in certain industries while also staying away from leveraged lending. We believe the current economic backdrop supports a relatively stable credit outlook, and our net charges for the year were slightly higher but still in line with peers. Speculation about a potential recession has been on our and other bankers' minds over the last couple of years, but it is not evident yet, and we try to spot the potholes beforehand. The income continued its improving trend, with wealth management leading the way, along with loan level swap income and loan prepayment fees. The additional valuation adjustment to the T&L transaction is proof positive that this acquisition is, is exceeding our initial estimates. Expenses were higher in the quarter, with the majority being in compensation and the non-cash contingent liability for the T&L acquisition. Consultant and technology expenses continue to increase as we prepared for CECL, regulatory costs for being $10 billion, and technology investments to remain relevant in the new digital banking paradigm. We continue to balance expenses with investments in the customer platform and product set. 
Our tech spend is embodied in more consumer-centric, efficient, and agile decisioning for our clients to enhance their relationship with us. Information compiled in our data warehouse and our use of data analytics will be key to understanding our clients' needs. Reliance on AI will likely expand in the years ahead, especially in the payment channels. And we're also investing in the universal banker model, better recruiting processes, and onboarding orientation, and constantly evaluating our branch network. As for M&A, we expended a fair amount of time and energy in 2019 assessing potential acquisitions and continue to have more than enough capital to achieve better returns for our stockholders through whole bank transactions and RIA purchases. We can fund our organic growth and support a solid and consistently above average cash dividend with, a, with only a 54% payout ratio and supportive buybacks when they meet our total return criteria. The consumer segment appears to be in good shape from both the credit and spending perspective, and the labor market may be the best we have seen in a generation. Fed interest rate policy is expected to be on hold for a while. With geopolitical issues, pandemic risk, and the presidential election grabbing the headlines, we believe the economy will continue to grow in spite of these distractions. With that, I'll turn it over for to Tom for his comments. Tom? Thank you, Chris, and good morning, everyone. Our net income was $26 million, or $0.40 cents per diluted share, compared with $35.8 million, or $0.55 cents per diluted share for the fourth quarter of 2018, and $31.4 million, or $0.49 cents per diluted share in the trailing quarter. Current quarter earnings were adversely impacted by a $2 million, or $0.03 cent per basic and diluted share, net of tax expense, increase in the estimated fair value of the contingent consideration liability related to the April 1, 2019 acquisition of New York City-based RAA, Tershwell and Lowy. As previously disclosed, the earnout of the contingent consideration is based upon TNL achieving certain revenue growth and retention targets over a three-year period from the date of acquisition. Based upon TNL's recent positive operating performance and improved projections for the remaining measurement period, an increase to the estimated fair value of contingent consideration was warranted. At December 31, 2019, the contingent liability was $9.4 million with maximum potential future payments totaling $11 million. Excluding this charge, the company would have reported net income of $27.9 million, or $0.43 cents per basic and diluted share, and net income of $114.6 million, or $1.77 per basic and diluted share for the quarter and year ended December 31, 2019, respectively. Our net interest margin contracted two basis points versus the trailing quarter and 23 basis points versus the same period last year. To combat margin compression, we continue to reprice downward deposit accounts with negotiated exception rates. This deposit rate management, coupled with an $80 million or 21% annualized increase in average non-interest bearing deposits, resulted in a three basis point decrease in the total cost of deposits this quarter to 65 basis points. Non-interest bearing deposits averaged $1.6 billion or 23% of average total deposits for the quarter. We will continue to thoughtfully manage liability costs as the rate environment evolves. Quarter end loan totals increased $66 million, or 3.6% annualized from September 30th, as growth in CRE, construction, and residential mortgage loans was partially offset by net reductions in CNI, multifamily, and consumer loans. Loan originations excluding line of credit advances reached their best levels of the year, up $106 million, or 30% versus the trailing quarter, to $461 million, but payoffs remained elevated, up $46 million, or 18% versus the trailing quarter, to $298 million. The pipeline at December 31st decreased to $905 million from $1.1 billion at the trailing quarter end, reflecting strong year-end closing activity. The pipeline rate has decreased 14 basis points since last quarter to 3.97% at December 31st. The lower pipeline rate reflects current market conditions and a decline in interest rates. Our provision for loan losses was $2.9 million for the current quarter, compared with half a million in the trailing quarter. Our annualized net charge-offs as a percentage of average loans were 26 basis points for the quarter and 18 basis points for the full year. Overall, credit metrics remain stable this quarter, with non-pouring assets totaling 55 basis points of total assets at quarter end. The allowance for loan losses to total loans decreased to 76 basis points from 79 basis points in the trailing quarter largely as a result of improvements in qualitative allowance factors. 
Non-interest income decreased slightly versus the trailing quarter to $17.7 million as lower swap fee income offset increased bank loan life insurance benefits and loan prepayment fees. Excluding the increase in the fair value of the contingent consideration liability related to the T&L acquisition, non-interest expenses were an annualized 2.05% of average assets for the quarter. Core expenses increased $1.2 million versus the trailing quarter, with consultancy and audit costs related to CECL implementation, additional examination and consulting fees that totaled $1.4 million driving the increase. We did once again benefit this quarter from an FDIC insurance small bank assessment credit of $758,000 and our total remaining FDIC credit potentially realizable in future quarters is $1 million. Our effective tax rate decreased to 23.6% from 24% for the trailing quarter, and we are currently projecting an effective tax rate of approximately 24% for 2020. That concludes our prepared remarks. We'd be happy to respond to questions. We'll now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then 2. This time we'll pose moment momentarily to assemble our roster. First question comes from Mark Fitzgibbons, Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Hey guys, good morning. Morning. Um, just curious, you guys have been holding the balance sheet under $10 billion for a while here. Should we assume that, you know, absent any acquisitions, you'll grow through that $10 billion organically sometime, you know, within the next couple quarters? Uh, yes, this is Chris. Uh, absolutely, Mark. Uh, it was just the last quarter, and there was no real reason and initiative for us to go through absent an acquisition. So we uh, anticipate probably, again, Subject to payoffs and other things that may happen, that it would be happening in the middle of the year. Okay. And then, um, I, you know, wondered if you could share with us what total assets under management are today and and uh, specifically at uh, Tershwell Lori. Uh, total assets under management are at $3.4 billion. Uh, T&L is about $922 million. Okay. Um, and, and then I'm, I'm curious, um, of the $4.7 million in net charge-offs that you had this quarter, where did those come from? What was kind of the, the breakdown? Primarily the C&I category. Uh, it's about four, four borrowers that make up the bulk of that. Uh, diverse industries, no pattern to it. Um, really nothing, nothing notable in terms of an indicator or any future deterioration. Okay. And then, uh, Tom, I wondered if you could just share with us any guidance on the margin and expenses for, for 2020. Sure. The margin looks pretty stable for us. Um, you know, give us a plus or minus two basis points, let's say, but we expect to hold around these levels. Um, you know, we continue to see pr a downward pressure on the asset yield side of things, but we think we're able to manage the liability costs effectively. To uh, in terms of expense, uh, probably in the $51.5 million kind of range a quarter. We had about $207 million roughly for the full year expected and non-interest expenses. Okay. And then lastly, um, CECL implications, any updates there? You know, we're, we're not really providing guidance on the impact of CECL yet. Uh, we're on target with our, our, our planning, cross-functional uh, planning, the governance control frameworks in place. Uh, we're fine-tuning, completing validation of the model. So we expect we'll be in position to disclose those results in the 10-K filing. Um, Difficult to project future provisioning, though, uh, given the, the volatility associated with the economic forecast and the other model variables. So, well, more to come. And, and just one final question for you, Chris. You know, I'm curious as to your thoughts on the M&A environment, and if um, if there's a high, if if you know bank deals are a higher priority or asset manager deals are a higher priority for you all. Uh, well, with our capital levels, uh, we consider those. Uh, uh, opportunities for us to grow. There are obviously less and less available as the market's been pretty hot in the uh, New Jersey and in Pennsylvania. Uh, so we continue to see that as an opportunity for us to grow and leverage. Uh, so we will continue to do that and we will do it in the same disciplined manner that we do with every investment and utilizing our capital. So I would think, yes, it's always been on the, the forefront. I think it's just even more so now as we you know, go through $10 billion. In, in, in which is the priority, would you say, bank or asset manager deals? 
Uh, the answer would be yes. The most accretive, <laughs> definitely. Uh, if we can expand the, our deposit base and, and opportunity and you know, lowering costs, I think a whole bank acquisition would be preferable. But in the interim, we think that the wealth management space is probably going to have a lot more opportunities, being just a numbers game. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Hello? Mr. Zwick, are you there? Uh, hey, yes, good morning. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes we can. Right here. Okay, great. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I guess first starting with uh, with the loans, um, you know, noted the pipeline is down. It looks like it's down year over year and quarter over quarter. I'm curious what's driving that and whether it's a function of market demand or, or your appetite for loans given the, the interest rate environment or, or potentially some other factor? I think the seasonality in terms of the quarter over trailing quarter, um, a lot of strong closing activity period and still pretty stable levels or, you know, close to a billion dollars, 906 million, 906 million at the end of the period. Um, I think demand remains pretty consistent. We're not really seeing a, a big trail off here. I think this is Chris. Uh, the first quarter, uh, we're seeing uh, definitely some C and I uh, coming in at a decent level uh, of product we'd like. I think the pull through is only about 55% of deal sheets versus getting to uh, you know, finalized. Uh, certainly in the commercial real estate, also has been uh, pretty healthy. So we're looking forward to the first quarter being a little bit better than last year. Got it. And then just looking at the, the balances of multifamily loans, they declined throughout the year, uh, about $200 million year over year. Was that decline conscious on your part? I'm wondering if it's related to, to pricing or structure you're seeing in the market, uh, concentration perhaps, or, or maybe some other, something else. Well, it certainly has been a lot of people get, taking permanent loans out. Uh, the agencies are offering a lot of interest-only periods, uh, longer than we would ever anticipate for very stabilized properties. Um, so that has definitely hurt the uh, multifamily uh, space, and uh, there's some aggressive lending at some high leverage levels that we just would not do. And so when people want to take out proceeds and take it back up to 80%, we don't think that's a prudent uh, process for us. So they do move on. Appreciate the color there. And one last one for me. Um, you bought that stock, uh, stock, I think, in the first three quarters of the year. It doesn't look like you bought any in the fourth quarter. Um, curious kind of what drove that decision to step back and how are you thinking about the opportunity to repurchase uh, in 2020 versus the other uses of capital? And I know you kind of talked about M&A uh, already a little bit. Yeah, well, again, as always, profitable growth would be number one for us, and that includes M&A uh, as well as organic growth. Uh, we would like to relever the balance sheet. And Mark asked earlier about the uh, the drop and, you know, trying to ensure we stay below $10 billion and how quickly we think we can get up ahead of that. Um, we see steepness in the curve. We'll put some securities on and lever that portfolio up a little bit and hopefully then remix it to more profitable loans over time. Um, but uh, after growth, then certainly uh, buybacks and, and uh, dividends. Uh, the, the regular dividend will probably remain uh, fairly consistent given the, uh, the outlook, economic outlook, um, but we have plenty of capital available to do buybacks if the pricing in the marketplace makes sense. Great. Thank you for taking my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from Russell Gunther, DA Davidson. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning, Russell. Hey, I uh, wanted to follow up on your comments about the loan growth outlook. Appreciate the low single digit guide. I'm curious for your thoughts on kind of what the loan mix drivers of that would be. Um, and then, Chris, just any further color you could provide on what you think is driving the increased competition in CNI in particular? Uh, taking the first one, uh, we see, again, the commercial real estate uh, having a lot of opportunities. Obviously, you get size and scale uh, in our market and contiguous. Uh, we uh, definitely are you know, still involved in some of the construction with uh, very well-known uh, pr uh, principles that we've been dealing with for a lot of years, uh, so there's opportunities in that space. And the CNI side, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are trying to diversify their uh, balance sheets, so the competition is definitely there. And it's across industry sectors, uh, we do like to do owner-occupied properties uh, for the most part. Obviously, we like a little bit of collateral that uh, uh, goes along with the CNI credit and the relationships that come with that. 
so there's no real industry code or anything that we, we look at. I know that we've in the past de-emphasized a couple of industry sectors, and we just you know you, you, you have to be cognizant of what's going on in the business market to say what do you think is going to be the area that will continue to have you know, positive growth and uh, good financial results. Okay, very good, thanks. And then last question would be um, on the expense side of things. You know, understand the guide of around uh, fifty-one and a half million a quarter. And you know what the franchise investment is uh, and pressures there. I'm just curious if you think there's an opportunity, um, you know, whether it's branch rationalization or or some other leverage to pull to kind of help mitigate that. And maybe that's not, you know, a full year twenty impact, but um, just curious as to any any offsets to continued franchise investment. Uh, well, we certainly have always been evaluating the uh, franchise. Uh, with, with, we did a sale lease back of a lot of branches uh, a, a couple of years ago. Uh, we always evaluate the, the profitability of that network and the cost attached to it. Uh, so that's not something that's new to us. Uh, obviously, operating costs, as we've gone to over $10 billion, have you know the regulators in here on a full-time basis, uh, the risk characteristics of the, the enhanced uh, regulation have caused us to have to invest a little bit more in that space. Obviously, Cecil and all that uh, with all the consultants to make sure and the documentation that it just adds to the cost structure. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we're always looking at, you know, nickels and dimes add up to dollars, and so we're always looking around at the edges of how can we be more efficient, use technology, and at the end of the day, you know, we should be able to achieve uh, operating efficiencies through uh, some uh, people counts. So we're really always trying to do that. I think just in this interim period with all the things going on between regulatory and CECL, that just added to the consultant's expense that uh, hopefully will go down a little bit over time. Got it. All right. Understood. Thanks for taking my questions, guys. Thank you. Our next question comes from Steve. Steve, you there? Hello? Hello? Again, if you have a question, please press star then one on your touchtone phone. Our next question is from Colin Gilbert, KBW. Please go ahead. Wow. Good morning, guys. Uh, welcome to cyberspace, I guess. <laughs> the joys of technology. Okay. Um, so let me start. Let me. I, I think I don't even. If the last question was on expenses, but I just want. I'm just curious to to dig into that a little bit more. So. With the increased costs that you guys have had to carry with Cecil and Crossing 10, is the expectation then that, that those costs will not be able to reverse going forward, that, that some of these new investments are just going to hold? Or is it is the thought that those you, you, you will reverse some of those, but they'll be offset by other areas within the business? It's more part two. I think certain things are changing, but then other things are growing as we continue to expand and, and uh and, and build infrastructure. So uh, the numbers I kind of threw out were about fifty-one and a half million a quarter, about two hundred and seven million for the year is what we're expecting for non interest expense. Okay. And have you quantified? I know going into Crossing Ten, I, I think if I if I recall that your expense outlay seems 
fairly minimal. I don't remember the exact number. But have you quantified all in now what the cost has been for you guys to cross 10, putting Durbin aside, just on the expense side? You know, we got away from trying to even measure it because there was less specific to um, stress testing around uh, Dodd-Frank Act stress testing and rather just increases. So we kind of viewed it as more as, as growing uh, uh, capabilities and, and commensurate with the sophistication and size of the organization. So we, we don't really isolate it so much anymore. Okay. Okay. And then, Tom, I just wanted to make sure, did I hear you correctly that the pipeline yield, you, did you say 370? 397. 397. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, that's still quite a bit lower, I guess, than your portfolio yield. But given the NIM guide, do you still feel comfortable that even with the downward pressure there, you can offset it on the funding side, despite the fact that I feel like your funding costs are still are just so low already? Yeah, we think there's still some room. Um, certainly, uh, when I look at what's coming off in terms of maturities, both on borrowings and, um, and some of the time deposits, uh, there's opportunity there, and we still have some exception pricing deposits that we can move down further. So we think we can match it. Yeah, Colin, this is Chris. And obviously, we're seeing a bit of uh, fixed rate, longer term lending in the CNI space and with competition, and we, we tend to not win that business, so we don't think that that's the right place to be. So, and we have obviously focused on variable rates, um, you know, sometimes at our expense, but certainly. Uh, always being prepared and trying to match on an asset liability basis to be, uh, you know, pretty much a match funded, uh, not being one way or the other, whether it be liability or asset sensitive. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. And then just um, on, the, um, on the fee side, just, Tom, can you kind of give your outlook there for fees? Obviously, elevated this quarter um, for prepays, swaps. Maybe if you could break out what those specific numbers were in the quarter, and then just, yeah, your outlook overall for fees? Sure. Prepayment income was a million seven. That was up from a million five last quarter. Um, I guess the other large volume item is swaps. That was a million five uh, versus 2.7 million last quarter, so we did have a, a reduction there. So it okay. kind of keeps me in the range of like 16. I know it's pretty wide, but 16 to 18, given the volatility in those two categories, yeah. sort of where we land most quarters. Okay. Um, and then the can you remind us that there's seasonality, right, in the in the first quarter on service charges? It's jumped around a bit, but um, I just want to make sure that we're modeling that correctly. Uh, gee, I don't recall seasonality in service charges. On the expense side of things, we, we, ha we always have a little bit of seasonality around, you know, payroll taxes and, and typically uh, utilities and snow removals, that kind of stuff, although it's been a pretty mild year so far. Okay, but nothing on the service charge. Okay, there might have just been some other, other items. Um, okay, that was all I had. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait, no, I actually I did have one more. Sorry. Um, Dividend. Um, I know you had indicated kind of you prioritize capital and how you want to spend, which is very clear. Just curious about a special dividend. Yeah, we've done, I think, three or four specials in history. I think maybe it's three. Um, certainly something that would remain under consideration given the, the high levels of capital that we hold. And again, as to whether I, we prefer um, special dividend versus buyback really depends on the pricing that the buybacks are available at. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, I'll leave it there. Um, this is Chris. Obviously, the term special is what uh, has to be considered at the same time. If it was routine, then that would be part of our business model. That's not necessarily the case. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.